We've had our hands on Bayonetta 3 for a little while now, and I think we can officially say this game is cursed. It's had so many problems and controversies that have all overshadowed the game itself, which to be honest is pretty mediocre. But before we begin, I should give you a short primer on what Bayonetta actually is. Bayonetta is a game where you play as Bayonetta, the Umbra Witch. She made a deal with a demon, Madame Butterfly, to gain otherworldly powers, namely slow motion magic, enchanted guns, and the ability to summon demons made out of her hair. In fact, her entire suit is made up of her hair. And as you execute combos in the game, Bayonetta uses her magical abilities, causing parts of her costume to come undone and attack the enemies. The better you are at the game, the more skin you see, and that's really all there is to it. Bayonetta feels like playing a flashier Devil May Cry with the added boob factor. And back in 2009, when the first Bayonetta game was still new, this was basically the view of it on the internet. You can go back and watch the old Zero Punctuation review, or the short Game Grumps series, where they make fun of the ridiculous premise of the game, while still at least complimenting it for its gameplay. Meanwhile, Bayonetta fans on 4chan or GameFAQ loved the game, not just for its sex appeal, though they certainly loved that, but also for its high skill ceiling, replayability, and quirky style. Meanwhile, online feminists, who did exist back in 2009, though far less in number and nobody really cared about them, cried incessantly at how sexist or objectifying Bayonetta was. Nowadays, Bayonetta is considered a cult classic, but not a critical success, leading everyone to believe that it would be one of those thousands of one-and-done games that littered the 2000s. But to everyone's surprise, Bayonetta was revived in the Wii U in 2014 with Bayonetta 2! Nintendo picked the franchise up and funded a sequel out of nowhere, making it Nintendo exclusive in the process. And to everyone's astonishment, it wasn't dumbed down just because it's Nintendo. Bayonetta 2 remained just as sexual and over the top as Bayonetta 1, clearly a nod to the fans. And the game played exactly the same way. Same combos, same items. Some of it felt a little bit cheap, like they just reused parts of Bayonetta 1. But at the end of the day, it's more Bayonetta, and that's what everyone wanted. With the massive success of the Nintendo Switch, people felt Bayonetta 3 would come along eventually, and it did. And my god, this game is far inferior. The combos are drastically different enough that the game legitimately feels strange to play. They didn't add to what was there before, they changed everything. Bayonetta moves differently, like the game feel is fundamentally different. The weapons feel alien, and actually the weapon choices are a fair bit shallower than the first two games. And then there's just a lot of stylistic choices that I don't really get why they change. For example, Bayonetta's sprint form is no longer a Black Panther, but instead Madame Butterfly. Change can be good, you don't want a series like this to get stagnant. But this time around, the things that were changed were a part of what a lot of fans viewed as Bayonetta's core identity. Which brings us to the story. Bayonetta 1 was a pretty straightforward plot, and yes, there's going to be spoilers for all three games in this. In the first game, Bayonetta travels to the fictional European city-state of Vigrid, looking for the fabled Eyes of the World, a duo of artifacts that when brought together grant godlike powers. Bayonetta's already got one eye and she's after the other. She's also an amnesiac, and it turns out that the child hanging around with her is actually herself from the past, brought to the present by the last Lumen Sage, who are the mortal enemies of the Umbra Witches in order to restore Bayonetta's memories, because he's actually her father and… okay, maybe the story's a bit more complicated than I thought. The point is, Bayonetta 2 continues this very same type of thing. Sages and witches, fighting angels and demons, lots of gothic architecture and magic and cool bullet time fights. The series has a very distinctive style, and Bayonetta 3 respected exactly 0% of it. The story of Bayonetta 3 isn't connected to Bayonetta fighting her father, the last Lumen Sage, like in Bayonetta 1. Nor is it connected to Bayonetta fighting the god of chaos, Acer, to whom the eyes of the world originally belonged, like in Bayonetta 2. Bayonetta 3 is about how the world is actually made up of an infinite amount of timelines, and how man-made bioweapons are rampaging across each timeline, destroying and consuming them in order to become more powerful. And each timeline has its own Bayonetta, and alternate universe versions of the other characters too, who have been repeatedly losing in the defense of their own worlds. In other words, rather than a story about traveling to heaven and hell, we have a story about time travel and alternate universes. A newcomer to the cast is Viola, who looks to be straight out of Suicide Girls, and is an Umbra witch in training from an alternate dimension's future who, spoiler alert, is the daughter of that dimension's Bayonetta and Luca, the comic relief dude from the first two games, who time traveled back to our present after her parents died. She's literally just Trunks. Her plotline is identical to Trunks. She's even got the sword, the jacket, she's Trunks. This is not necessarily a bad plot. Trunks' hero's journey is probably the most compelling plotline in Dragon Ball, combining personal tragedy, loss of a mentor against an overwhelmingly powerful evil, a young person who has potential but isn't really ready yet, but they're the best we've got, and a last-ditch desperate one-way trip to an unfamiliar past to try and set things right. 
The issue is, this is nothing like what Bayonetta is supposed to be. Again, I'm not saying that change is always bad, but you're changing the foundations of the lore here. All the old lore and the conflicts aren't necessarily overwritten, they're just sidelined so much because the developer wanted to tell some new story about human bioweapons and alternate universes that wasn't even hinted at before. Viola ends up being the second playable character of Bayonetta 3, and she's different enough to warrant it. Instead of a double jump, she has a grappling hook. Instead of dodging to activate witch time, you have to parry with her sword. And her combos are noticeably different from Bayonetta's. Which makes me wonder why they had to make Bayonetta control so drastically differently from the first two games, if they were already going to have a character who controls drastically differently herself. It's around the time of the first Viola level in the playthrough that I noticed Bayonetta includes a skill tree, something that the first two games didn't have. I guess that's probably where some of the complexity from the other in-game systems went. It's nothing too crazy, bog-standard stuff, but I came to a realization just looking over the various upgrades. Viola's skill tree is about three times as big as Bayonetta's. In other words, you're expected to invest three times the EXP into Viola over Bayonetta. They couldn't make you play as Viola, the new Pussy Riot Tumblr self-insert character, more than Bayonetta in a game called Bayonetta, could they? Well, they do. And not only that, but spoilers again for the ending, the Prime Universe's Bayonetta dies and tells Viola she's the new Bayonetta. The end of the game shows Viola just chilling with the other characters, like Bayonetta would, implying that she's just going to be the hero now going forward. This is yet another case of the new entry into a beloved property introducing a new character that the author actually wants you to care about, and spends the entire thing kicking aside everything you loved about the previous story in order to pump up the new hero. And yes, bad news, this is actually happening even in Japanese games now. The western skin suit rot has slowly but finally crept its way over to Japan, primarily through the indie scene. One symptom of it that isn't unique to Japanese games, but maybe a little bit more prominent in them, is the amount of fourth wall breaking, self-referential fluffing the games tend to do. Look at No More Heroes, for example. The first No More Heroes, published around the same time as the first Bayonetta, in fact, only slightly broke the fourth wall. It had subtlety. Well, as much subtlety as a game can have when it's all about chopping off mafioso's heads with a lightsaber and watching a geyser of blood and gold coins erupt out. What I mean is, when it got referential, it was quiet, quick, and the developer didn't care if you missed it. Compare that to the latest game, No More Heroes 3, published about a year ago. It has all the same problems as Bayonetta 3. It feels too different, it looks too different, it controls too different, the styles change too much, and the developer, rather being subtle, would rather whack you over the head with all the cutaways to arcade-looking minigames, or how some of the story is told in a visual style of a drastically different game, or how, yeah, we're even spoiling No More Heroes this time, the final boss is literally a Super Smash Brothers match. This whole, let's remove the gameplay loop that you love and replace it with an old arcade game thing is even in Bayonetta 3, where the story is periodically interrupted to cut away to John doing some sort of platformer stealth thing that you might have seen in the 1980s. Why do we gotta do this? I bought Bayonetta to play Bayonetta. I bought No More Heroes to play No More Heroes, not to have the developer wank off all over me. So we're like halfway into this indefensible video, and I haven't even talked about the actual controversy surrounding Bayonetta 3. Yeah, this isn't strictly a game review channel. As much as I love doing let's plays and streams and reviewing games, this wouldn't be an indefensible if there wasn't another angle to talk about. And that other angle, the controversy surrounding this game, went viral so much, I bet that most of you who didn't play the game only knew about those controversies. You probably haven't even heard the game is actually shit yet. Let's go in order from the least to most hilarious. First, Naive Angel Mode. Remember when I said earlier that Bayonetta is known for its sex appeal, with Bayonetta stripping in order to use her clothing as a component of her magic? Well, in case you didn't like tits for some reason, you can now turn on Naive Angel Mode, which completely censors the sexual content right out of the game. No more Madam Butterfly's ass hanging out, none of it. I mean, it's kinda cucked, sure, but at least they didn't just censor the whole game entirely and make everyone play without the sexy stuff. I just don't see the point of it, though. The style of Bayonetta is over-the-top, ridiculous sexuality. Without that, you really just kind of have a mediocre beat-em-up. I will never not find it funny that in 2007 when Mass Effect came out, and you could see a lesbian blue alien booty, it was rightoids on Fox News screaming about how the degeneracy in video games was destroying children's minds. While in 2022, it's the leftoids who are talking about how progressive and pro-woman it is that you can turn off the witch booties in Bayonetta now. Oh, by the way, they're still angry because they didn't censor enough, though. Also, I haven't tried out Naive Angel Mode myself because I'm not a cuck, but some people online claim that it actually makes the game easier. And the game's already pretty easy. This is a literal game journal mode for the Patrick Klepics of the world who think that they'll go blind if they look at a naked woman. Second, Helena Taylor. Oh boy, y'all saw this go viral, didn't you? Helena Taylor was the voice actress of Bayonetta throughout all of her appearances in the main games, as well as other side appearances, until Bayonetta 3. Why not Bayonetta 3? Well, hear it from the woman herself. 
Bayonet a franchise made an approximated $450 million. That's not including merchandise. As an actor, I trained for a total of seven and a half years. Three years at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda, with voice coach Barbara Barkery, and four and a half years with the legendary Larry Moss in Los Angeles. And what did they think this was worth? What did they offer to pay me? The final offer to do the whole game as a buyout, a flat rate, was 4,000 US dollars. In case you don't know, $4,000 is a remarkably low fee for a game with this much voice acting and this much anticipation behind it. Bayonetta might have begun as a cult classic, but after Nintendo revived the IP and pumped a bunch of money into it, it legitimately became a mainstream, more popular franchise. For the amount of work that Taylor would be expected to do, and the amount of money the game was projected to make, $4,000 was indeed a ripoff. And because she claimed that her bosses wouldn't negotiate, she called upon Bayonetta fans to boycott the game. I didn't want the world. I didn't ask for too much. I was just asking for a decent, dignified living wage. What they did was legal, but it was immoral. I am asking the fans to boycott this game and instead spend the money that you would have spent on this game donating it to charity. Oh, also she spent some time rambling about poverty in the UK for some reason? I decided to do it to stand up in solidarity with people all over the world who do not get paid properly for their talents. Fat cats cream off the top and leave us the rotten crumbs. You know, in England right now, there are nurses going to food banks to feed their children. This is not right. This is not acceptable. It impacts mental health. Because of it, I suffered from depression and anxiety. I worried that I was going to be on the streets. That terrified me so much that once I was suicidal. I am not afraid of the non-disclosure agreement. I can't even afford to run a car. What are they going to do? Take my clothes? Good luck to them. All right, I guess it's Nintendo's fault that London is stuffed to the brim with immigrants. But it turns out this was all fake. Jason Schreier, doing the first real reporting of his game journal life, got a hold of documentation from Platinum Games showing that Taylor was offered $4,000 per recording session for at least five sessions, rounding out to at least $20,000. In response, Taylor asked for a six-figure paycheck and residuals from the game's sales, which Platinum rejected. Taylor later changed her public story, saying she was actually offered $10,000, not $4,000. And when she emailed Hideki Kamiya for help, the game's director and notorious Twitter troll, he offered her personally an additional $5,000, which she rejected. Whichever of these two stories is true, it's not the $4,000 from that viral clip, which quickly shot up to 9.5 million views, and caused a lot of deranged, left-leaning fans to attack Platinum Games and the new Bayonetta voice actress, Jennifer Hale, for being capitalistic sellouts and money grubbers. In response to this new information, Taylor put out a list of charities she thought deserves your money more than Nintendo and Platinum Games. A closer inspection of the list revealed, however, that one of the charities was an anti-abortion group. And in real time, we watched the Game Journal narrative change from support this oppressed member of the proletariat, this passionate creative who just wants to get paid what she's owed by her exploitative capitalist boss, to string this bitch up for holding, whatever you might think of it, a relatively common political stance. It's a wonder to behold that these leftoids were completely fine with her blatantly lying about her contract. All of that is forgiven because fuck the corpos. But now she's pro-life? Oh, that's too far. Third and final. I bet you're wondering, Dev, how do you know these people are all leftoids? You don't necessarily need to be a leftist to think someone's getting paid poorly and want to see their conditions improve. It might not be the case that Viola is wearing the progressive skin suit of the Bayonetta franchise. Removing sexual content is dumb, but not exclusively leftist. Why am I making this conversation political? Well, here's why. The story of Bayonetta 3 has confirmed, spoilers, in canon that Bayonetta is straight through her many, many relationships with Luca across all the different universes. And for some reason, at the same time as the Helena Taylor shit was kicking off, the entire plot of the game was leaked to Twitter, causing LGBT Twitter to go into full meltdown mode. Read some of this copium. These people are acting like this is a fucking Armageddon. I'm not gonna lie, this was the most fun Twitter discourse this entire year so far. 
It's not misandry speaking when I say Bayonetta should be a lesbian. I could never in good conscience unleash on a normal ass man. Luca was getting strapped to literal rockets in Bayonetta 1. That poor soul does not stand a chance. To be fair, there is a recurring theme in specifically lesbian-oriented storytelling, where the women characters are sexy and powerful and competent, and the men are attracted to them, but are stupid and doofy and can't actually keep up. And the woman eventually falls for another woman because the incompetent men around her can't match her energy. These people were hoping that this was Bayonetta's dynamic with Luca, because Bayonetta is sexy and powerful and competent. Luca is the comic relief, and Bayonetta is often paired with John, another sexy and powerful and competent woman. And Bayonetta literally goes to hell to save her in the second game, so yeah, fair enough. The tropes of lesbian fiction are all here. I will say though, this isn't Nintendo committing a crime against the gays, it's just a video game. What really kicked this off, though, was some they-them game journal over at Paste Magazine, which is both the name of her workplace and the lunch she brought in, who said, Do straight guys love this? I truly find it hard to believe. I'm sorry, I just don't believe it. I don't believe straight men are into this sexually. What do you mean? You can't believe straight guys are into amazingly hot women whose tits and ass are hanging out and who runs around in skin-tight black clothing? What exactly are you missing here? Who is the gazer in Bayonetta? I genuinely have no idea. I don't know who looks at a woman's body in the way the camera observes Bayonetta other than queer people. There's a huge reason why the game attracted a big queer audience. I think thinking about it in terms of story is not exactly describing what queer players are picking up about Bayonetta. It's got very gay vibes. It shoots for objectification and lands on camp. The best part of this argument is that rad femmes like Anita Sarkeesian back in 2014 were saying the exact opposite of this shit. That Bayonetta's design, mechanics, and characterization is created specifically for the sexual pleasure of straight male gamers. And now, we've got people crying that Bayonetta is confirmed straight in canon. Seeing the Bayonetta discourse go from this is the gross male gaze, women would never like this, to men would never like Bayonetta, she's empowering to women, is fucking wild. If there's anything that tells me that the concept of the male gaze is bullshit, at least how these people view it, it's watching literally the exact same images morph from disgusting male-centric fetishization to empowering lesbian-centric queerness right before my eyes. The problem with that tropes of lesbian fiction view of the topic, though, isn't just that the whole thing collapses into copium when the creator says she's straight, actually. It's that in their copium is the idea that Bayonetta cannot be strong, sexy, or competent if she's in love with a man. And that is the angle that Polygon editor and lobotomy patient Maddie Myers took. This is a long, stupid article, like all the nonsense these people put out, but the central thesis is this. Making Bayonetta straight undermines her character. Myers doesn't like the man she ended up with, or that she ended up with a man at all. And after Myers got clapped back for this take, she posted online that of course the game was doing well. It was the straight men who were buying it and rating it online. The game was made explicitly for them. There's a lot of problems with this logic, let's run them all down. One, Bayonetta being confirmed as straight doesn't happen until the end of the game. And when you put this tweet out, it wasn't really widespread knowledge yet. People were still playing through it. If Bayonetta being confirmed straight would lead to a bump, it wouldn't have happened yet. Two, Bayonetta always got consistently high scores from fans, and even though I don't like Bayonetta 3 personally, I can accept the idea that they might all get relatively similar scores. Three, Maddie, your view of Bayonetta 1 and 2 was that it had an obvious queerness to it, so much so that Bayonetta 3 has disappointed you. From your point of view, if Bayonetta 3 is only getting high scores because it's made for men, why did Bayonetta 1 and 2 get similarly high scores if it was made for the queers as you see it? And four, I don't believe that Maddie Myers or any other game journalist or any of these fucking crying Twitter plebs are actually fans of Bayonetta. You want to know why? Because Bayonetta says she's straight or at least into men and therefore bi in the first fucking game. Do I look like I have any interest in children? Now making them? Well, that's another story. Here is what actually happened in the minds of all of these sexuality-questioning millennial teens who grew up to be obnoxious identity politics riddled officers of the Twitterati. You saw a strong, sexy, competent woman in Bayonetta, who existed in a game with an over-the-top style that is, yeah, pretty campy. You saw that she had a strong, sexy, competent foil in John, who is just as flamboyant and dominatrix-like as her. And you imagined them together. Maybe you even got off to fan porn of it or something. And because you are your own toxic stereotype of the LGBTQ community, whatever the fuck that is, you instantly think that a strong, sexy, competent woman who wears fetish clothing and has a dominant personality has to be gay. But she doesn't. Because no matter how many family-friendly drag shows you popularize, or outdoor BDSM displays go marching down the street on Pride Month, being gay does not actually require you to be a walking display of gaudy sexuality. 
saying that Bayonetta has to be a lesbian, look how hypersexual she is, is a more toxic attitude towards lesbians than anything I've ever heard a conservative say in over 20 years now. Those guys, worst case scenario, they'll call you a dyke and move on. They're not going to demand you start drinking your partner's piss in public or you're not actually gay. All of this insanity surrounding Bayonetta 3 is what the game is now known for. The voice actor stuff, the gay stuff, no one actually talks about the quality of the game itself. And that's probably for the best, because it is mediocre and disappointing. I don't care that Bayonetta's straight. Frankly, the story actually does make more sense for her to be with John. They do have two games of history together. The problem is that Bayonetta 3 fully disregards those two games of history in many ways, not just with her relationship with John. All this online nonsense surrounding the release was pretty fun. But once you get past all that, you have a game that, frankly, I wouldn't recommend picking up unless you were a hardcore Bayonetta fan. And if you are, you've already got it.